tales for dark nights. Want to make sure you never miss a Chilling Tales for Dark Nights video again? Be sure to subscribe and hit that bell to turn on notifications. The following program is intended for mature audiences and may contain strong language, adult themes, and content of a violent and sexual nature which may not be appropriate for everyone. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. If it's the darkness you seek, you won't be disappointed. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and it's time for our appointment. In this place, there is no sun, and nightmares do come true. Here, instead of shadow falling, the shadows follow you. Consider getting comfortable before the air grows colder. Prepare yourself, if you dare. Come, inch a little closer. If darkness is what you're after, seek no more your searches through. You haven't found the darkness, traveler. The darkness <laughs> has found you. <laughs> Good evening. You're listening to Horror Hill. Welcome to Season 2, Episode 11. I'm your host, Jason Hill, and I'm thrilled you could join me tonight. In today's episode, we bring you two bone-chilling tales from Timothy Garver and Brian Martinez about public transit terrors and forest fiends, all with an insatiable hunger that only you can satisfy. You're listening to the standard edition of this program. If you'd like to show your support and enjoy ad-free versions of this and all our other episodes, as well as hundreds of tales from our audio archives dating back to 2012, visit simplyscarypodcast.com and click Patrons in the upper menu to sign up today to get instant access from our friends at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights. Thank you for your support. Now, allow me to escort you to a place where the sun dies and nightmares come to life, where those who seek the darkness need look no further. Welcome, listener, to the Horror Hill. You haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you. Our first tale of terror this evening comes to us from author Timothy Garver. In it, we'll discover the length some people will go to in order to uncover the truth, and how far they'll go to experience the unusual firsthand. But what do you do when what you're seeking is after you. Without further ado, from author Timothy Garver, I present to you, The Nearest. Most children say they want to run away from home, but few ever do it. My brother Joey was definitely in the latter category using the excuse of freedom and independence to constantly break our parents' rules. He was a dreamer, an adventurer, someone that refused to be tied down by limits. But I never knew how deep his obsession became until last year. Three of his friends, Brad, Robert, and Jeff, had started scouring deep web blogs to find the ultimate getaway spot somewhere so remote and off the beaten path that it would allow them to do whatever they wanted, without anyone to judge them. I remember when I saw him chatting away on Discord, he would always say that he wasn't really going to just up and leave for some make-believe fantasy. But that changed after he started reading articles about Andrew Slater. 
Slater was a nature photographer from central Idaho with a story that seemed like the opposite of my brother's. A single dad with hardly enough time to keep two jobs, let alone see his kid or even have a social life. Sometime last spring, though, all that changed for him when his son had gone missing in a stretch of the Sawtooth National Forest. Joey and his friends talked about the case constantly, how Slater had spent three weeks with a posse to try and find his kid, only to emerge from the woods nearly 400 miles from where he started a full month later, entirely alone. According to Slater, something magical had happened during that period of time. His son captured by an evil force called the Nearus, and Slater refused to speak to anyone about it unless they took him back there. Most chalked it up to him being some kind of serial killer, having used the woods as a burial ground for his unsuspecting victims, his son being the first one. But not Joey. He had always been a believer in the fantastical and the bizarre. So, one August day... He too decided to gather his friends and go out to the forest to complete the picture that Slater had painted for him in his mind so vividly. To go find this mythical beast. What if you don't come back? I remember asking him. Sis, I'll be fine. I wasn't concerned about him finding Faye or even his mysterious nearest. I was thinking he was finally using this as a reason to escape responsibility. If it makes you feel any better, how about I livestream the whole thing? You'll be able to keep an eye on me night and day. Me and the guys, he told me. For some reason, I agreed to that ludicrous notion. Brad and Rob were amateur vloggers anyway, so if anyone could keep tabs on Joey, it was them. I was sure that my brother would find a reason to explain why his dreams weren't able to come true and call the whole thing off. But instead... What transpired over those next few summer nights was nothing short of a living nightmare. He uploaded his first stream on August 16th, our father's birthday, and made it an interview with Slater himself. As you may have guessed, the local authorities didn't buy his whole The Tree Swelled Up My Son story, and he has been spending time in the county lockup, probably going to serve a life sentence at the state penitentiary, or worse. Anyway, Joey managed to convince the cops he was a reporter and got this statement from Slater. For the sake of this account, I've transcribed it. You're going back there. You think it's that simple, do you? Find the nearest. Why wouldn't it be? The nearest only lets those in that it calls. I've read your transcripts with the police. I know the steps it takes to get inside. You don't know a thing. I went in there to rescue my kid. That's why it let me in. But you... You're a trespasser. A thrill seeker. You don't have a purpose other than your own selfishness. What's wrong with that? Because it will consume you. You and all your friends. The closer you get, the stronger the pull. Look, I didn't come here to listen to your voodoo crap. Now, the cops here have agreed to let you be my guide under a few conditions that I coax them into. Do you want to hear them or not? Waste your breath if you want, but I won't be going back there. One, that you will agree to have a police detail with us at all times. Two, You'll guide us to where your son Ryan is buried. And three, you will change your confession to guilty so they can get you sent up to the Mac sack quicker. <laughs> None of those will even be possible. Well, the first one, maybe. But the others... Why would I ever agree to that? I don't even know where Ryan is. What if I told you that I did? I would call you a liar. I searched that entire hellhole of a forest for a full month and never found him. Not even a trace. I've looked into the local legends about the nearest. Gone to the dark web and found images. Found articles on other missing kids. I... 
I believe you, Andrew. I believe there is something wicked about those woods. I think I know how to find it. So, then it has called you. You're next. What? I've changed my mind. Tell Deputy Jackson I'll agree to the terms, but I am stipulating one of my own. I want to bring my own camera along. I could probably spend days dissecting that interview, wondering whether Joey was lying just to get Slater to cooperate, realizing how crazy my brother was for asking a convicted criminal to guide him into a supposedly mystical forest to find an ancient evil. It sounded like something out of an adventure book. None of it made any sense. But Joey was never one to think rationally about these kinds of things. He acted on impulse. And the consequences were always the ones that hurt everyone but him. A few days later, his next stream made me stop dead in my daily routine. Andrew Slater was center stage. The hunting blade in his right hand and a fresh kill in the other. It took a second for the camera to adjust and I realized it was one of the canine units the police had brought. A dozen officers were pointing their weapons at the felon, demanding he drop his knife. But Slater was so nonchalant it was as if the animal's death had been decided long before they ever made it to this stretch of trees. You wanted passage. Now the bond between our world and the Nearest is stronger. Be thankful the Nearest accepted such an offering. Last time, one of the team had to slit their throat to make it across. There was a bunch of murmuring and confusion from his audience. Joey directed the camera toward himself and provided an explanatory monologue. I have tried to capture the essence of Andrew's madness as best as possible. Signal is weak here. Honestly, I don't even know if you will get another chance to speak. I know this was supposed to be foolproof, but we are well past the point of no return, sis. I've seen too much to go back now. Slater. Slater, I don't know if he is psychotic or a visionary. But he claims this patch of trees is the gateway between our reality and something bigger than the universe itself. My brother paused and started to become emotional. I didn't want to say anything before, because I know we don't really believe in ghosts and shit. But ever since I saw those photographs and those drawings... The ones that Slater did bring back with him. There were these... These mangled corpses from the forest. I've been having these dreams. I don't know how to explain it. It's not the normal sort of dream. It's... It's like what happens when you're just listening to an audio cassette or trying to learn a new language. There aren't any images, just voices. At least a dozen swarming voices that make my head feel like it's going to explode. Then I, I see that thing. The nearest. It's stretching its wings like a mutated bat. Beckoning me. Behind him, there was a commotion as it seems that Slater has somehow disappeared. He crossed the trees and then faded into darkness. Or so the image makes it seem. Crazy, right? That's how it's been since day one. Something about this whole thing. It's like Slater said before. The forest and the creature inside it are calling to me telling me to come. There's something here I meant to see. It's just beyond this stretch of trees. My brother sounds different somehow, as if he is under a trance. 
A few officers are shouting orders, following the path Slater took, all of them fading into the darkness, like it's a fog. Yes, this is goodbye. Hopefully not forever. It took a whole two weeks for the other videos to come, and I frantically checked my phone and email every chance I could. The search and rescue operation was only supposed to take a few days. I knew something was wrong. I could feel it in my bones. The way Joey seemed infected with the same madness. Maybe they all were. Was it possible this strange creature was drawing them nearer as its own namesake claimed? Soon, the videos only confirmed it. A nightmare, unlike any imaginable, happened to those poor men and women. And Joey got to see every glimpse of it. He's staring down at a body noting the decay in the ashy skin, trying to determine the age of the corpse, perhaps. One of the troopers moved toward him, tilting his head slightly as he also examined the oddity. They've been dead for a while, he confirmed. A few of the other men came also to look, all of them as equally perplexed by this discovery. All right, quit your gawking and spread out. Slater couldn't have gotten far, Rob barked. He was one of the few who refused to get close to the decaying flesh. Where could he have gone? Another officer, one of the few women in the group, asked. I wondered the same thing. He was just in front of them in the last video, and this one seemed to be from the same grove of trees. Whatever sort of trick he played to get us here is probably how he escaped, Brad reasoned. I thought about the corpse, and how I felt certain that the facial structure resembled Slater... I wondered if Joey saw the same thing. Maybe we should check the footage. The officers watched as he started the feed, the image of all of them moving toward the forest playing again. Slater was standing there, moving toward the ash to spread the blood across the ground. Then, the forest shimmered, and Joey remarked, Did any of you notice that? The two men didn't answer, and kept watching as the strange reflections returned, and finally, Rob muttered off camera, What kind of witchcraft is that? It's this place. I, I have a feeling that this is the place Slater kept telling me about. The realm of the nearest. The cop laughed. <laughs> That's a dumb shit name. Where'd he come up with that? He muttered. It's weird, that's for sure. But what else did he tell you about it? Another wondered. Nothing, except that this creature controls people. And consumes them. Makes them... A part of it. Rob said. The path will be near once you see. What your eyes say cannot be. He added. I remembered that being a famous line Andrew had repeated over and over, like it was a chant. The next video skipped forward a few hours near to sunset. So, you really think maybe we aren't where we think we are? A cop asked. A few of the other officers were returning from their search for Slater without any results. Someone mentioned that the markers they were using now were suddenly gone, replaced by scratch marks. Are you sure? I could have sworn I saw a marker a few miles to the east, Joey argued. GPS has been acting a little funny too, a forest ranger added. Brad checked his phone, unsurprised to see that the screen was totally black. Can you lead us to the marker you saw? Someone asked. Yeah, should be easy. It was a humongous old birch, Joey said, and gestured for all of them to follow him to the east. As the video shook, it felt like I was there listening to the sights and sounds. As they traveled, I noted that the sun had almost dipped below the horizon, and darkness was covering the forest quickly. It gave off a strange orange glow as the last bit of twilight pierced the canopy. How could that be? 
when the timestamp for Joey's stream said it was mid-afternoon. Was something playing tricks on them? As they got further into the forest, it got darker until nothing was visible above, and I could only hear the sounds of boots crunching leaves. Finally, Joey turned on his flash on the body cam, and I could see immediately why the monstrous birch stood out to him. It was wider than anything that could have been in that region of the forest, and a grove of gray and purple flowers covered the forest floor, which made the eerie tree seem a little more frightening for a reason I couldn't quite discern. Joey also seemed to regard them cautiously. He led the video feed around to the opposite side of the tree to show the mark he was referencing. It was large, like a wild animal had used the bark of the birch to sharpen its claws. We saw the same thing. We sure didn't put it there, Rob muttered. The markings looked like they were too precise for any creature, and they formed what looked like an upside-down capital letter A, with three lines straight down the middle of the lettering. It looks fresh, maybe a few hours old at the most. Must be campers close by, Brad reasoned as he looked about the grove. We'll set up camp here tonight, an officer instructed everyone. I can take the dogs and make another sweep, see if we can pick up Slater's scent. They sat in silence for a moment as they waited and Joey addressed the camera, his viewing audience of one. Sis, all of this feels strange. It shouldn't be this dark. I haven't seen any animals or even insects. No running water. Everything is off. Slater led us somewhere. But I, I don't think it's a forest from our world. And I'm not even sure it was really him. I think it... I think it was this creature. It wants people to know it exists. Why, I can't be sure. As he finished talking, the officer with the canine units returned to the grove. It's a bit disorienting out there, sir. The dogs are picking up several scents, but none that seem fresh, he explained. It's like someone is dragging a carcass all around the woods. Well, ain't that the shit, the commander said, glaring at Joey. Slater couldn't have gone far. It's dark, and this forest has a lot of animals that prowl at night. He'll seek shelter, Rob said. He's killed twelve people out here. He's been a ghost before, Joey pointed out. A ghost... Maybe that was what he had been all along, I wondered, recalling the corpse. Or maybe it was the creature, taking on his human form to entice others. Come nearer, Neris. Make us yours. Near to the dead. To be alive. Now we are gone. Part of the hive. That was Rob in the background, humming like a madman. What did it mean? The group settled down around the wide grove, taking out what little gear we had to sleep, and a few of the SWAT officers guarded the exterior in different shifts. Joey kept his light on to illuminate the strange stillness. Despite the calmness of the forest, it felt disturbing to watch, like there was a predator waiting to strike. The next few videos were clearly Joey and his friends talking to different people to get their opinions on the forest and on the nearest. Is this going to wind up online or something? The woman asked. I've been camera shy all my life. Can't really say I want any beauty pageant, so forgive me if I don't like to talk, she added. Shit is strange, man. You know that song I was singing earlier? Ain't got a clue where I heard it before. Just came to me, Brad said. The atmosphere seemed peaceful for a moment, but it didn't last long. There was a soft chirping echo across the forest, almost like crickets. But as they all listened, it grew louder and louder, until it seemed to surround the entire grove. Even the cops nervously raised their rifles to see if something might come out of the darkness. Then silence covered everything again. I don't like it here. Rob remarked. I think that makes all of us, 
the commander said. My brother turned his video feed toward the flowers that covered the forest floor, trying to relax and focus on their vibrant colors. As Joey kept looking at them, I couldn't help but notice that the tiny petals seemed to flicker back and forth. Joey seemed to notice it as well and reached down to touch one of the flowers, picking it up and marveling at its simple but elegant beauty. As he kept staring at the petal, I noticed that it flickered again, and then it lifted from his finger and fluttered about his hand. It wasn't a flower at all, I thought, as I watched the small, strange-looking insect glide about. It looks like a butterfly of some kind. The female officer observed as she looked about at the other flowers and noticed they were also starting to shimmer with movement. Maybe we should move somewhere else, Joey observed. Several more of the winged insects spread their shiny wings and lifted into the open air to fly about. There have to be hundreds of them here, the commander realized. Slowly, the chirping noise we had heard earlier returned to the forest. As Joey kept recording, I saw the butterflies speed up as the noise grew louder, as though agitated by it. Ow! Someone cried out in surprise as one of the insects flew across the upper wrist and cut them. What the? Joey muttered, and then one of the insects sliced across an officer's face like a razor. Several more of the butterflies began to swirl about the group, like miniature fighter jets, cutting at them as a perceived threat. We need to move, Joey barked. The swarm was growing larger by the second as they all tried frantically to find cover. I felt my heart beat faster as they ran for cover. The noises grew louder as well, the strange insects furiously attacking all. Behind him, an officer fell to the ground as more of the butterflies swarmed around his body, each one slashing across his exposed skin as they angrily attacked. Grob! Brad shouted as a trooper behind him took out his firearm and began to fire at the endless array of insects. It seemed like they were all forming a singular mass. But amid the hollow shell of the countless butterflies, it was clear that firing on them was simply a waste of ammunition. Joey moved to the other side to try and help Rob. His screams grew louder as the swarm surrounded him. I held my breath and watched as the creatures consumed him like ravenous piranhas, cutting at him relentlessly. They all moved together as one, getting nearer and nearer until the swarm suffocated. Leave him! The commander called out as the other butterflies rose to join the storm of blood and fury. Rob writhed in pain, trying to cover his body and face as much as possible as the butterflies finished their feast. Then, the feed slipped to the next video. It was daytime. There were fewer members of the team now, and others with more blood and bruises from the bizarre forest. There was this strange, deep moaning in the background too as if the entire woods were chanting that bizarre melody. The group was moving deeper into the dark forest, more sounds surrounding them as the SWAT team turned on their night goggles and led them to the maze of trees. All Joey could do was hold on to his camera, use the same type of lens effect, and try his hardest to keep up. Something grabbed a hold of his foot and he tumbled downward, his camera slipping from my hands as my brother fell onto a mass of wet leaves. From this angle, I saw the canopy and held my breath. The tops of the trees were made of people's carcasses. Their bodies twisted and pushed almost beyond recognition. Food for this supernatural garden. And there, amidst the feast, was the nearest. Its ghastly wings spread impossibly wide its glowing eyes mesmerizing my brother. It leapt toward him for the kill. The feed went black again. Somehow the group had returned to the grove, but the massive birch was now gone. Brad was the one filming now. Had something happened to my brother? I had no choice but to watch and find out. There, in the shiny gray mass of flowers, I could make out what remained of Rob's body, and the female officer took off her helmet to honor her fellow comrade. 
The constant song from the forest and the few remaining officers seeming agitated. Was it making them turn on each other? The next clip showed what I feared the most. Joey was a victim as well, and now his carcass seemed to be host for some new life. Brad zoomed into the open wounds. My brother's body was swollen near to his abdomen and thighs, as though the bites from the insects had caused some sort of allergic reaction. Help me turn him over, the voice said, trying to sound professional. I saw only a handful of patrol officers left. I heard bones crack, and under the unsettling noise another strange sound, like something moving. Brad looked at the pallid face and eyes, and I was left wondering if the nearest had taken control of his corpse. Then, I watched in shock as small green worms began to wriggle their way out of his open mouth. Claire, Brad said, pulling the officer away. She saw them as well, and Joey's face became more swollen as the worm split his skin open, sliding down across his pale cheek and making soft screeches in the morning air. Brad shut off the camera again. I found myself hyperventilating. Those creatures were the larvae of this beast, seeking out new hosts to come and be infected, devouring all life. It took all of my strength to click the final video, but I needed to know where this ended. Brad was examining a bag that had Slater's name tag. Then, I realized it was the photographer's son's backpack. The nearest was silently watching in the lens reflection as Brad flipped through the contents of the bag. The first item was a photograph of a group sitting around a campfire. All of them were wearing a logo connected to what looked like a scouting program. Slater was in the picture, and despite its age, he looked the same. Other faces looked familiar. Rob and Jeff were in there too. They said they didn't know anything about Andrew. Guess that was another lie. Or maybe the nearest is creating this narrative now, making its own story. Brad told the camera as it focused on the image of the two together at the camp alongside Andrew. The picture looked unfinished. Next, there were some news articles that he held on the camera to give viewers a chance to read. A Southern College student that had applied for a film class disappeared over the weekend of September 13th, 1998, with no clues to suggest where she went. The studio in question, Fusoya Entertainment, was later found to be a shell corporation. They were creating a movie based on the nearest. I can't really explain where I got the idea for the legend, the director said in an interview. It just sort of came to me the other day. I felt like I was a child again, experiencing my first boogeyman when I sketched it out. It felt like I was being guided somehow, he explained. The movie was never finished due to the college student disappearing, but no evidence ever linked them to the girl's disappearance. Several of the other articles Slater's son had related to missions involving the Navy or Homeland Security an experimental bioweapon to use the nearest against terrorists. It makes itself become what they fear. It creates itself and feeds off of itself. It's a self-perpetuating monster, the report said. Then there was one about a clinic that got shut down in Utah for questionable practice. A doctor that was on the run for illegally selling prescriptions. Stuff that made people have hallucinations. Brad was examining the picture of the scouts closely again. It's the same number of victims. Slater brought them here. These patients are the ones that first made a connection to this nearest. As though hearing its name evoked its strength, I heard the ungodly beast scream in the background. And the picture started to fade. To become a part of the forest too. Nothing here is real. Brad realized as he touched the ground. His lens focused on the central part of the grove, where the trees had once stood. 
and tried to touch it. It looked like he was pressing against something invisible. The tree was still there, cloaked like a weapon. There was a throng of voices around him as he too began to fade away. The path is set. Your guide awaits you. Mourn for those who come, for those who were before shall be found again. Who was he talking to? I saw that strange creature bound off into an empty landscape. And then, the video ended, and I found myself numb and confused. What had happened to my brother? The strange story these videos told haunted me. I showed the videos to the police, but they didn't believe my story. Said it was a hoax from a sicko that likely had killed good cops. I know I will need to go to this strange forest and see for myself. I suppose you could even say that I heard the nearest calling me too. I can't stop thinking about it. I'm nearly at the grove now where Slater took them to a world behind. And I see the sun going over the western edge of the tree line behind me. I can hear the creature calling out for my blood. I take the first step in the direction my brother went. Into a forest of magic and danger. A place that does not exist except to destroy. It felt as though it were right. The path I was meant to be on. But I can't say for certain why. I just know. I have to get nearer. You've been listening to The Nearest by author Timothy Garver. As performed by yours truly. Well, I was never scared of butterflies before, but I am now. <laughs> Thanks, Tim. Thanks a lot. I'll never look at monarchs the same way again. Or bats, for that matter. Or trees. Hmm. You know what? I think I'll just stay inside, curled up into a fetal position and hide under a blanket. That seems safe. It did work when I was five. Hmm, what could go wrong? <laughs> up next, I've got a second helping of horror for you. This one comes to us courtesy of author Brian Martinez and goes to show that sometimes death isn't the end, it's just the beginning. Without further ado, from author Brian Martinez, I present to you Bad Blood. I never thought that dying would save my life. But then, death has always been a funny son of a bitch. Three weeks ago, I made an appointment to see my regular doctor about an annoying cough that wouldn't go away. Got so bad, I swore that Gary, the guy who sat in the cubicle next to me at work, wanted to strangle me with my own phone cord. I didn't like him much either, so I considered us even. I walked into my doctor's office, figuring I'd gotten myself another case of bronchitis, I expected to walk out in five minutes with a prescription for the good cough medicine that makes me feel all warm and squishy as I drift off in front of the TV. She insisted on an x-ray, though, so I humored her, figuring I didn't have much choice if I wanted to walk out with that precious slip of paper. They say the quickest way to a man's heart is with radiation, I joked, and she laughed her way out of the room. But when she walked in a little later with a developed x-ray in hand. She wasn't laughing. She popped the film sheet into the holding clips and flipped the light switch, revealing the black and white image of my lungs, specifically the gray cloud that had settled over them, like the weather at a doomed parade. 
I'm no trained professional, but the crowd of dark spots gathered in my lungs didn't look right to me. Non-small cell lung cancer is what it's called, though to me, non-small sounds like a nice way of saying big and scary. And yet they said I was lucky that they caught it early enough to give me a fighting chance, so long as we took what they called an aggressive plan of attack. Let me tell you, I did not feel lucky. There isn't enough TV in the world to distract you from a diagnosis like that. Pretty soon your thoughts start to turn in on themselves. You analyze and reanalyze every choice and cringe-inducing mistake you've ever made. More than anything, my mind kept returning to all those times I'd lectured my parents about their pack-a-day smoking habit. I'd leave them informational flyers and email them links to support groups. It might be cool if you don't die, I tell them. Maybe stick around for a bit, just to see how it goes. I eventually gave up when I realized they were never going to change, and I was somehow becoming the bad guy for trying to keep my parents alive. Well, guess what? Those assholes retired to Florida with a clean bill of health, and they left me holding the check. Or, more accurately, the medical bill. They might have been blood, but it had slowly become bad blood. They were the reason I didn't carry a phone anymore, so I didn't have to live with the possibility of a surprise phone call. I didn't even bother calling to tell them about my diagnosis. Either I would do that when the treatments were over to celebrate my victory over their second-hand gift to me, or my obituary would be the greatest I told you so in modern-day history. You can call it petty. I call it something to look forward to. When I signed in for my first chemo session, the girl who handed me the dictionary-sized stack of paperwork to fill out asked if I had someone to drive me home. I thought it was a pretty stupid question on account of us living in a city where public transportation is always about 10 feet away. Seeing the look on my face, she explained that chemo takes a lot out of a person. I think that's the idea, I said. When she missed the obvious, and some would say brilliant, joke, and went to describe the feelings of nausea and exhaustion I might experience as a side effect of the treatment, I could see she wasn't going to let the subject go easily. Being that I was already experiencing nausea and exhaustion... I did the right thing and lied to her face. Don't worry, I said. An old friend will be waiting to pick me up. If it makes you feel any better, it wasn't a total lie. I consider the A-train to be a very old, very dear, very smelly, and very piss-stained friend. After filling out all that paperwork, I never wanted to use my arm again, which was right about the time a nurse brought me to the infusion room and told me we'd be using my arm for the treatment. My oncologist showed up, who I found to be a man who had never smiled in his life. He told me I'd be receiving my own personalized blend of chemo and pre-medications, including anti-nausea meds, anxiety meds, allergy meds, and steroids. I asked him if he could add a shot of whiskey to that cocktail, but the joke went over like a cardboard flamethrower. When the doctor with the fantastic sense of humor left, the nurse hooked me up to the poison drip and gave me a few tips about how I might feel. She said the steroids might give me energy, while the allergy and anti-anxiety drugs might make me sleepy. So an eight ball, I said. When she gave me a confused look, I added, Coke and heroin, the only way to party. Hopefully it's not that strong, she said. Um, and uh, what about this stuff? I asked, nodding to the clear liquid dripping into my bloodstream. How will that make me feel? Usually not great, but it makes the cancer cells feel even worse. I could certainly agree with that kind of logic. The enemy of my enemy, I said. And finally, she smiled. Then, she sat in a chair across the room and got busy, forgetting I existed. Nearly five hours later, I walked out of the oncology building feeling like I'd just gone on a weekend bender with Hunter Thompson and Satan's pharmacist. The sun had gone down and the city's more colorful citizens were starting to crawl out of their caves. 
I felt like I was swimming in slow motion through a crowd of grinning, talking fish, and they were all trying to sell me something. I had the vague thought that there was someone I was supposed to meet, until about three blocks later when I remembered that it was a lie I told that nosy woman at the front desk to get her off my back. By the time I reached the stairs leading down to the subway, my head felt like an overinflated balloon about to float up into the sky, leaving behind sad children and crying hippies concerned for the dolphins that would choke on me. The light glittered up at me from the subway like a flashlight dropped in the ocean, and I followed it down into the cold, dark ground. I didn't have to wait long for the next train, which was good because the benches were looking way too comfortable to risk sitting on them and falling asleep. When a dirty subway bench starts looking like a king-sized bed, you know you're in trouble. The A train was crowded, but luckily not packed too tight with people. Most of them were probably heading to a game or a concert or, well, whatever it is normal people did for fun. It was only by some miracle that I found an empty seat. My breath must have stunk like radioactive rat's ass because the woman in the seat next to me turned away and gave me a nice look at the back of her neck. She pretended like I wasn't there, which, to be fair, was pretty much true. I wasn't all there. Not really. My brain felt like old jelly, and my veins burned like a gasoline fire. As the automatic doors closed and the train squeaked out of the station, I could feel my head being pulled toward the floor. The invisible cowboy called Sleep had roped my neck and was swiftly taking me down tying my hands and feet together to leave me helpless. The last thing I heard was a tinny-sounding announcement about a delay due to construction on the tracks. I distantly remembered something about a big, expensive project to dig a new tunnel and add extra subway lines, but I could barely think over the thumping of the tracks beneath us. The rhythmic sound grew slower and heavier, and my eyes did the same. They were impossibly heavy, unable to stay open. My head swirled with chemicals and the muffled sounds of voices drifting away to nothing as I fell and fell through the darkness. In my dreams, I was sitting in a cubicle, surrounded by shadows. My arms, both of them, were hooked up to tubes, long tubes that ran high above my head and into the shadows. Inside the tubes was what looked like tiny black ants, a parade of them marching into my veins, making my arms itch and burn. So many ants. They moved like liquid, like oil sludge through an engine. I tried to pull the tubes from my arms, but they wouldn't budge, like they were soldered to my flesh. A permanent part of me. I looked up to see the bags they were attached to, where the ants were coming from, the origin of their death march. Instead of IV bags, I saw two bodies dangling above me in the dark. The tubes ran from their arms to mine, their faces just barely visible. It was mom and dad, smiling down at me, squeezing their arms to make the ants march faster laughing as they fed me the blackness that lived inside of them. Before my eyes were open, I knew something was wrong. Usually falling asleep on the subway meant missing a stop. Life had continued on without you, and it was on you to shake off the sleep and catch up. But this time, it was all wrong. This time, something had changed. Not only had someone turned the volume down, they changed the channel entirely. Tuned into a different frequency on another wavelength, the scattered voices of the A-train crowd had fallen silent, replaced by the strange, overbearing echo of the steel cars moving through the tunnel. Tick, 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 ticking, like a drawn-out time bomb. My eyelids opened like two forgotten sarcophagi, dry and scratchy as the ancient desert. I was staring down at my own shirt, my neck bent at a sharp angle. As I picked my head up, pain shot through my shoulders and neck. 
the muscles sore from so much time spent hunched over. I would have cursed or cried out, but my throat was even drier than my eyes, and no sound came out when I tried. Blinking, trying to focus, I looked around at the train car, attempting to make sense of what I saw. The train's overhead lights had gone out, leaving the car to be lit only by a single strip of yellow emergency lights. Much stronger were the lights coming to the windows from the subway tunnel. They strobed past, illuminating the inside of the car from front to back. A slow, steady pattern, like we were being scanned by an alien ship. But the really strange thing, the thing that made me blink the sleep from my eyes and fight the pounding in my temple, was what those lights lit up. The train car appeared to be transporting not commuters, but corpses. A few dozen dead bodies, sitting upright in their seats, rocking back and forth from the movement of the train. Light flickered slowly past them from the tunnel outside, playing across their slumped, unmoving forms. I watched the bodies sway in the strobe light, feeling the moments stretch on and on. Just me, and a train car full of dead bodies, moving through the earth like a serpent in the night. It had to be a dream. It was too surreal, too bizarre to be real life. I glanced up, expecting to see my parents still strung up by tubes, but saw only the ceiling of the train car, illuminated by passing lights. On weak, sleep-heavy legs I stood needing more than anything to know what was going on. To know what frequency I'd woken up in. I don't know if it was the cocktail of chemicals swimming in my veins or the adrenaline rush of fear, but my legs shook like a newborn deer, learning to walk. I stared at the dark train car, silently begging, praying for someone to move and break the spell. Only the rocking of the train moved the bodies, swayed them in their seats, the faint sound of their clothes shifting against the metal and plastic benches. For some reason it hadn't occurred to me until just then that I'd been sitting next to someone when I fell asleep. The woman who pretended I didn't exist. I was starting to think she was right, that I was a ghost drifting through the afterlife. Which was crazy, of course, but <laughs> then so was what I'd woken up to. I looked back at the seat next to mine and found her exactly where I'd left her. Her head was slumped over, like the others, and she looked just as dead as them, her head swaying to the rhythmic rocking of the train. But she wasn't exactly as I'd left her. There was something different. Something new about her. The neck she'd shown me when I sat down had something sticking out of it. Almost like a large pyramid at the base of her skull. It was thick and short, and it came to a sharp point. Careful not to disturb her, I steadied myself against the swaying of the train and leaned in for a better look. It looked like an arrowhead erupting from the nape of her neck, complete with a dribble of dried blood at the entry point. As I got closer, I made out tiny rows of barbs. Just when I thought the woman had the oddest piercing I'd ever seen, the thing on her neck did something I really, really wish it hadn't done. It moved. Like the tail of a rat settling into its nest, the thing on her neck shifted and buried in deeper. My dry throat found its voice again as I nearly fell back, letting out a small guttural cry. The woman's slumped head shifted in what at first I thought was the movement of the train, taking a sharp curve in the tunnel. But then, it moved again this time rising up, the neck craning, the head turning toward the sound I'd made like a sluggish dog alerted to trouble. 
If I thought the barbed tail moving in her neck was shocking, it was nothing compared to the sight of the woman's eyes. Her eyelids rose like curtains at the world's worst play, revealing two white orbs. The centers were barely discolored by what used to be her corneas, and the passing lights of the subway tunnel I saw no recognition, no reaction to the light. The woman, if she was even aware of me, couldn't see me, couldn't make out my horrified expression staring back at her, no matter how much she craned her neck and aimed her dead, milky eyes at me, her mouth slack, and her features as barren as the surface of a cold moon. The way her head tilted reminded me of a puppet as if not moving by choice, but by something working it from inside. With a hard realization dawning on me, I turned away from the white-eyed woman and looked at the next closest person to me. A young guy in a hoodie rocked in his seat, arms limp at his side, head slumped over. Inching closer to peek over his hood, I made out the already familiar shape on the back of his neck. A barbed tail surrounded by dried blood. The girl next to him, wearing hoop earrings and a fake fur coat, had the same on her neck. I looked around the darkened train car, still slipping through the tunnels, lights passing in rhythm like the beat of a funeral dirge. And in that moment, alone among the bobbing, half-dead commuters of a train that didn't appear to be stopping, I finally realized the inarguable truth of what I'd woken up to. I'm dead. At the sound of my voice, little more than a whisper, the slumped head of every person in the train car shot up. I froze in place as a hundred heads holding two hundred white eyes scanned the dark, ears tilted, trying to locate the source of the sound. Their movements were exactly like the woman's, the moves of a puppet. Suddenly, I felt like I was going to piss my pants. I held it, though, held my piss and held my breath as the slack-jawed crowd with the tails in their necks scanned the train car from their seats for whatever didn't belong, whatever wasn't one of them. What they would do if they found it, if they found me was not something I wanted to find out. At that point, I realized I had two options. The train didn't appear to be making any stops, and it was only a matter of time until the blind, infected, uh, whatever they were, people in the train caught me standing in their midst. My first option was to sit back down in my seat and wait it out, wait until the train stopped on its own or someone shut it down. There was no telling how long that would take, though. And by that time, I would probably piss myself and get sniffed out by the white-eyed creeps. The other option was to shut it down myself. There was no way of knowing what had happened to the train conductor, but considering we'd blown past the last few stops without signs of slowing down, it was safe to assume they either knew what was happening and wanted no part of it, or they'd been taken over as well. Either way, it meant making my way up to the conductor's car, getting inside, and somehow convincing the conductor to stop the train. Whether that meant by words or by force, I didn't know. One more glance at the woman I'd slept next to was all I needed to make up my mind. There was no way I was going to sit next to her and calmly wait for a miracle to save me, not with that unblinking silently drooling look on her deadened face. I'd rather sit next to a crying baby on a flight from New York to Singapore. My only consolation was that I'd sat at the front of the train, and so only had to cross one car to reach the conductor. With the slowest, quietest footsteps I'd ever taken in my life, I made the excruciating trek from the back of the car to the front holding the poles to keep me steady when I could, every inch of the way staring at the white, unblinking eyes around me, watching for the slightest hint of recognition. 
When I passed someone standing, their stiffened arms hooked around the poles. I moved around them at the pace of a glacier. By the time I reached the door at the front of the car, my legs were sore from staying so tense, and they'd already been tired from the personalized poison cocktail swimming through them. With the sliding door finally in front of me, I knew I'd reached a crucial moment. Do or die, if you will. After spending so much time being as silent as possible, I was about to break that silence very abruptly. There was no slow, quiet way to do it. Once the door was even slightly open, the wind from the moving train would rush in, and there was no way of knowing how the puppets were going to react to it. Not well if I had to guess, but there was no going back. There was no other way. With my tense fingers wrapped around the cold handle, my body like a coiled spring, I wrenched the sliding door open and at the same time flung myself to the open space, the wind hitting me like a full body punch, then spun and wrenched the door shut again, holding the handle in case anyone tried to pull it open. Wind buffeted my body, my clothes flapping like a flag in a storm as the two cars bumped and swayed together. A small chain on either side was all that kept me from tumbling off the train and into the dark tunnel. Through the door's window, I watched the car I'd just escaped from come to life, like the world's worst puppet show. Passengers lurched to their crooked feet and stumbled blindly toward the door, bumping and fumbling past each other to find the noise they'd just heard. I held on tight to the handle, relieved to see none of them try to open it, not with any conviction. A few of them reached out and slapped at the door, making movements that resembled a functioning human, or maybe a dog trying to recreate something it had done accidentally. But luckily for me, it wasn't coordinated enough to actually open the heavy door. Their blind eyes stared out the window, nothing separating us but a half inch of glass and a world of understanding. These weren't human faces in front of me. There was something alien, filtered through a layer of human bone and muscle. I'd walked among them, tempting death with each footstep. But now... Now came the hard part. I could see him in there, through the thick, dirty glass of the final door. I watched as the train conductor sat perfectly still in his seat, his hand resting on a large button on the console. Since he was wearing a windbreaker with a collar pulled out, I couldn't get a look at his neck to see what might be hiding there, but the eeriness of his posture, the crooked way he sat in the chair with his foot on the pedal, didn't give me much hope. After about half a minute, as I gathered my courage from the wind, the button under the conductor's hand started to flash. It looked like some kind of alert, but I had no idea how trains operated, so it was only a guess. After another thirty seconds passed and he hadn't pressed the button, assumedly because he couldn't see it, it began to buzz sharply, so loud I could hear it over the wind and the clatter of the train. The moment the noise started, the conductor slapped at the button, shutting off both the noise and the light at once. Just like that, I understood what I was looking at. It was some kind of dead man's switch designed to make sure the conductor was still both alive and awake to turn it off in the event of an emergency. Apparently, he was both alive and awake, but probably not the way the designers had planned. His mindless reaction to the stimuli was what kept the train going. It was a repeating pattern. Things make noise. Hit thing until it stops making noise. Repeat. To be honest, it didn't look much different from the way I looked at work which hit a little too close to home for me. If that thought bothered me, it was nothing compared to the realization that I was standing on a train, between moving cars no less, that was being operated by a blind man, himself operated by some kind of parasite that had dug itself into his brain. It was only a matter of time before we ran into trouble, be it a stopped train or some other blockage the conductor would have no skills to see, much less avoid. With a look around for something, anything I could use as a weapon, and coming up with a big, fat, nothing, I gripped the handle of the conductor's car. 
took a breath, prayed silently to every god I'd ever heard of and a few I hadn't, and flung open the door. The conductor turned to face me with a slackened face and two milky white eyes that looked right through me. He was a large man, with pockmarked skin and a graying beard. He rose from the seat like his shoulders had ropes attached to them. A bad performance of Peter Pan with two uncoordinated stagehands just out of view working the pulley system. I had the bright idea that maybe he could be reasoned with. That whatever was controlling him might understand the words taken in by the ears of its host. I figured it was worth a shot, trying to reason with him. At least for the sake of my own conscience. With only a second or two to spare, I thought of the most diplomatic thing I could come up with on such short notice. Sit down. I don't want to kill you. It certainly wasn't my best work. I paused for a moment to see how my extended olive branch would be received. To my surprise, the conductor paused as well. He cocked his head like a dog hearing the peanut butter jar and opened his mouth. Except that wasn't right. It wasn't that he opened his mouth, but rather his mouth was opened for him. I waited to hear what he had to say in return. The first words exchanged between two different species since... Well, maybe ever. It might just turn out to be a historic occasion. Potential planetary war avoided by two individuals breaking down the walls of communication. Except that's not what happened. Instead of words, a noise rose out from inside his throat, like the droning song of a cicada during a hot summer. I watched in disgust as two thick antennae pushed past the conductor's tongue and lips, feeling the air around it. I thought it was part of the thing that was controlling him, conducting the conductor, so to speak, until it managed to crawl all the way out of his mouth, tail and all. It was a totally separate creature from the one in his neck. How many of those things were inside him? And more importantly, was I going to throw up on myself? It was long, nearly a foot from end to end with a sectional body like a blackish pink worm and a spiked tail that wrapped around the conductor's neck. It made its way onto his shoulder with surprising speed, wet with saliva and fast as hell. The face, if you could call it that, was little more than an eyeless suction cup lined with rows of needle-like teeth that glistened as they shifted. As the creature tested the air with its twitching antennae, its long body tensed and coiled. I had already decided what thought needed to be communicated between our two species next. You are one nasty little bastard, I said. And that's when it jumped at me. The thing sprung off the conductor's shoulder aimed right for my face, its wormy mouth open and teeth rotating. I barely had time to move. Purely by instinct, my hand shot up in front of my face, blocking it from being hit. Instead, the creature wrapped around my wrist and squeezed tight, like a boa constrictor with a mouse in its grip. Its antennae twitched wildly, tail whipping at my arms it struggled to reach my face. I felt its needle teeth clamp down on my exposed wrist. My nerves lit up as it bit down hard, teeth digging in. I screamed, tried to smash it against the train wall. I was desperate to get it off me, but it moved, making me slam my own injured arm into the wall. I screamed again. It pulled its suction cup mouth from my arm and hissed like a cockroach, its tiny teeth wet with my blood. I tried to shout back at it, tell it to crawl up its own ass, but it went again from my face. Served me right. Now wasn't the time for witty comebacks. I did everything I could to shake it off, smash it against something, but it was too fast, too slippery. Suddenly, I remembered the conductor was still there, and I turned to find his puppet hands reaching out toward me. He wanted to restrain me, to help the creature that had just crawled out of his mouth do its job. I raised my fist to punch him right in his creepy beard, realizing too late it was the arm that currently had a demonic worm wrapped around it. I'd screwed up, 
exposing my face to the slimy beast to do God knew what. But just when I thought it was over, just when I thought I was the next puppet in the world's nastiest children's show, something funny happened. The creature on my arm seized up, its long body going so tense and cut off the circulation to my hand. I felt waves of peristalsis pulse through its form. A sound almost like a wet cough came from its needled mouth, and as I watched it twist and convulse around my arm, I noticed even the conductor seemed to be listening to the sick sounds it made. The creature's skin shifted to a gray pallor. Then, its group loosened, no longer restricting my blood flow. Whatever it was doing, I didn't want to find out. I reached out, grabbed it around the middle, and squeezed as hard as I could. It squished and popped between my fingers like a rotten tomato. Once it had completely stopped squirming, I dropped it. I fell to the floor with two soft thumps, one for each half. I stared down at it in disbelief, ignoring the smell of my newly painted hand. I looked up at the conductor, expecting him to lash out at me, to demand revenge for whatever the hell had just happened to his tenant. But the large button, which must have been flashing while I'd fought the creature on my arm, began to buzz for attention. He cocked his head, listening blindly to the noise, then fumbled back into his seat as if I was no longer there. He slapped the button to make it stop buzzing, back at work like nothing had happened. But he was too late. The emergency brakes engaged, nearly throwing us both to the floor. With a long, dry screech of metal, the train came to a stop in the dark tunnel. I breathed a hesitant sigh of relief. We were no longer in danger of smashing into something up ahead. But being that we were sitting dead on the tracks, the risk was now that another train would smash into us. Not exactly a big difference results-wise. I stepped over the dead worm thing while keeping a close eye on the blind conductor. Without a button to press, he'd become just as useless as all his blind passengers behind us. Mounted under the console was a heavy tin box with first aid equipment inside. I used it to smash in the conductor's head, starting with the tail in the back of his neck. He didn't scream. The creature did enough of that for the two of them. After taking care of the conductor and his passenger, I opened the dented metal box and used one of the bandages inside to wipe the slime off my hands, the other to wrap my bleeding arm. Then, I found a heavy flashlight that worked well and felt solid in my hand. I checked in on the train passengers through the window. They returned to their seats and were once again sitting blind and half dead, as if awaiting instructions. What those instructions would be, I didn't know. I didn't want to know. There was only one thing I did know. I needed to get off that train and find my way out. Maybe warn people about what I'd seen down there. But that was a very distant second. If there was time. I climbed down between the train cars, nearly falling off in the process. My clothes got dirty with oil and grease, but I didn't care. The only thing that mattered was leaving the train of the damned behind and getting above ground. At that point, I noticed something interesting. The big bite wound in my arm wasn't bothering me at all. I studied the bandage under the beam of the flashlight and found the blood had already stopped flowing. Even though the skin around it was red and inflamed, it didn't hurt at all. In fact, it was almost numb to the touch. It made me think of mosquitoes and how their saliva works like an anesthetic so we don't feel them working on us. From what I recall, they even inject us with anticoagulants to keep the blood flowing. Could these things do something similar? Numb us up, but heal the entry wound instead to preserve the host? I didn't want to think about that either. Not until I got the hell out of hell. With the flashlight in hand, I looked both ways down the tunnel where we'd come from, and where we were going. They both looked equally unpromising. I decided to move forward, telling myself it was a sign of optimism or some bullshit. 
The truth was I didn't want to walk along the train and past all those windows to catch even one glimpse of all the lifeless puppets in there. Just the thought of it sent a chill up my tired back. The tunnel lights were a lot further apart than I remembered, where before they'd passed by in a steady hypnotic pattern to light up the train car of seemingly dead bodies. On foot, they were a few minutes apart, meaning I spent more time in the dark than I did the light. The flashlight helped, though even combined, the lights weren't enough to beat back the shadows of that cold, dead place. Dirt and small rocks crunched under my dragging feet, echoing off the walls. It felt like an eternity down there in the dark. Emptiness behind. Infinity ahead. But the real problem was... I wasn't alone in those tunnels. Living in the city, you get used to the sounds of rodents and insects. The scratching of rats. The pitter-patter of roaches searching for food. You don't like it, of course, but... You kind of accept the inevitability of dirty things in your life. They could be kept at bay for a little while, killed and contained and kept away from your food, but eventually they always find their way back in. Except what I was hearing wasn't rats, and it wasn't roaches either. All around me, coming from the shadows and off the walls, was the shuffle of rocks and dirt. Invisible things sliding through the darkness, crawling and slipping along the ground and over the train tracks. I knew exactly what they were, what they were looking for, and I considered turning off the flashlight to make sure they didn't find it. Then, I remembered it didn't matter anyway. They were blind as bats. More so, since they were actually blind, it probably didn't matter if I kept the flashlight on, just that I not make any noise. I decided to keep it on so I could see better and not trip in the dark, thus making noise and attracting attention. Still, I didn't aim it directly down at the ground. There was no point in pushing it, and I really didn't want to see the ground moving around my feet. After what must have been eight or nine years or twenty minutes, depending on how you do the math, I found a door. It was unlocked, thankfully, and it led to a maintenance area that looked like it hadn't been used in over a decade. It was a large room, carpeted in dust and rat droppings, without a single light bulb to light it up. I didn't know what a damned thing in it was used for, other than a few broken down generators and an old mop, but I wasn't planning on sticking around to find out. I hurried to the stale-smelling place, through another door, and up a stairwell thick with cobwebs and cigarette butts, tripping over my own feet the entire way. After a few turns and another door, I found myself ejected unceremoniously into a subway station I'd never been in before. It really didn't matter, so long as it got me that much closer to ground level. Though, as I weaved my way across the platform and up another flight of stairs... I noticed that the station was completely empty. Not even a ticket booth was occupied. The sight was troubling. But at that moment, I cared only about getting to the surface. About reaching the air and the light. And God help me. Even the people. My legs were tired and my heart pounded and my lungs felt like they would burst but I charged up those final steps faster than I'd ever run before, like an overdue baby, ready to be born. Finally, I was free, above ground and out of the grave. The night air felt cool and refreshing on my hot, sweaty skin, and even the city's smoggy air was an improvement on what I'd been breathing. I gave myself a few seconds to enjoy the victory and take in the feeling. I'd made it. I'd looked death in its eyeless, suction-cupped face and lived to talk about it. When the novelty of being alive wore off, which took all of ten seconds, I spotted a police officer standing near an intersection. The traffic was at a standstill, and my guess was she was there to direct it. Seeing a real live authority figure, the responsibility of warning someone about what I'd seen hit me like it hadn't before. 
people needed to know what was going on to stop it from spreading. And if I was going to be the selfless hero to do it, recognized for the rest of my life as the man who saved them all, then all the better. Officer! I shouted as I ran up to her. Down there! The subway! They need help! Creatures! Horrible things! My words were a mess, coming out a few at a time and mostly out of order. But as she turned to face me, to look not at me, but through me, with those clouded over eyes and that blank expression, I knew my words didn't matter. None of it mattered, because no one cared. Not the officer in front of me, not the people standing blindly around us. Not even the drivers in all the cars stopped all along the street, as far as I could see. The city was eerily quiet, yet still full of people. But to call them people was an exaggeration. They were puppets. A city of puppets standing around waiting for their strings to be pulled. The only sounds I heard were the idling of car engines and the useless changing of traffic signals. That and the crawling, the shuffling and slithering of legless things in the alleys and under the ground. I backed away from the police officer before she could open her mouth and birth the inevitable. When I found a somewhat secluded place in a small park, away from all the white-eyed, slack-faced puppets, I sat down on a bench and buried my face in my hands. Was I the only one not taken by those things? And if so, should I feel lucky about it? Or somehow offended? Was I actually beneath the standards of blind, brain-sucking worms? As I sat on the bench contemplating what to do next, where to go or who to call, I rubbed my aching neck. Between the chemo cocktail and my adventure down below, which included the cardio-heavy act of beating a man to death, I was tired to my bones. My fingers touched something. Something on my neck. I jumped up from the bench, panic coursing through me, and slapped and clawed at the back of my head to pull whatever it was loose. I would die before I let one of those things turn me into a puppet. No way was I letting them win. Not after all I'd gone through. But nothing came. There was no tail. No creature. I looked at my hand and found it stained with dry blood. Touching my neck again, carefully, I felt a large wound there, all caked with scabs and coagulated blood and only a faint stinging to go with it, more for my clumsy slapping and clawing than anything. It didn't make sense. But then, then I thought of the anesthetic in the mosquito saliva, the coagulant, and I thought of what happened to the conductor's car when the creature bit my arm. It was almost like an allergic reaction I'd witnessed, a violent response to something foreign and dangerous, a reaction to my blood, to the chemical cocktail floating in my veins. The chemo had turned my blood toxic, not just a bad taste but a dangerous one. Those four hours under the needle had been like being fitted for armor, a radioactive shield, protecting me from the tiny, vile dragons of the world, the enemy of my enemy. As I stood there, trying to understand how dying had saved my life, how the monster inside me had protected me from the ones outside, I became aware of footsteps on the sidewalk nearby. They were normal footsteps, not the shuffling of puppet feet, and as I stood silently in the small park, I watched a hooded figure walk past. She was fairly tall, a young woman in a purple hoodie, and when she turned to casually glance at me without stopping, I saw beneath her hood. She had no hair, only eyebrows, 
and a hard stare at the chick she'd been to hell and back. She was gorgeous in a princess warrior kind of way. With those gray eyes, she'd stared down the same death as me, taking the same poisons, killing herself to live. After we locked eyes for one intense moment, she simply nodded, then kept walking until she disappeared around a corner. Two ships passing in the night. I took a deep breath, filling up my diseased lungs with night air, inflating those twin monsters inside me. Monsters locked away in a rib cage. Then, I found a phone and dialed a number I hadn't dialed in years, watching the puppets walk blindly past. Fake lives. With fake meaning. My father picked up, though it was on speakerphone as usual. My mother was in the room too. They both started talking at once, asking about the things they were hearing about on the news. I cut them off, stopping them from talking over each other and told them to listen to me very carefully. <laughs> um. <laughs> oh, there's good news, and there's bad news, I explained to them. The, um... <laughs> The good news is... <laughs> I have cancer. <laughs> the bad news is... <laughs> you don't. <laughs> I hung up before they could say another word. Then, I went off to find the Princess Warrior. It was time to start a new tribe. A poisonous tribe. One free of strings. You've been listening to Bad Blood by author Brian Martinez, as performed by yours truly. If you enjoyed that last tale, please check out more of Brian Martinez and his work at the new horror fiction website, creepypastastories.com, where you'll find not only more of his macabre fiction, but an author profile with links to where you can connect with Brian on social media to keep up to date with his newest releases. Or... Check out his offerings on Amazon, available for purchase now. Thank you for your support of indie horror and of tonight's authors. I'd like to personally thank you for joining me for this episode of Horror Hill. Don't forget to tune in again next week, when I yet again regale you with a handful of tales to terrify, plumbed from the most depraved depths of the human imagination. Tonight's episode featured tales from the very talented Timothy Garver and Brian Martinez. The Nearest was written by and presented to you courtesy of Timothy Garver. Timothy is an indie writer from South Arkansas. All his life he has enjoyed horror and making monsters. The Nearest is his first professionally published work. Visit him on Reddit for more, where he can be found under the username The underscore, dark, underscore, dove. Bad Blood was written by and presented courtesy of Brian Martinez. Brian is the author of more than a dozen works in the science fiction and horror genres, starting with his apocalyptic debut, A Chemical Fire, a deeply personal blend of loss, science, faith, and humor. A Chemical Fire established many common themes in Martinez's writing, Martinez studied film at Long Island University, where his short films played at annual festivals. His works have appeared on screen and in print, and have been adapted to audio for YouTube, podcast, and audiobook listeners. He lives on Long Island, New York, with his wife Natalia and their pack of wild dogs. For more information, please visit his website at bloodstreamcity.com. 
and sign up for his mailing list to receive free stories and news of future releases. If you enjoyed what you've heard on today's program, please take a moment to stop by our iTunes page or wherever else you listen to your favorite podcasts and leave us a five-star review and a kind word. It makes a huge difference and would mean a lot to me. Again, if you'd like to hear a premium ad-free edition of tonight's and all of our other episodes, visit simplyscarypodcast.com today and click the Patrons link in the menu at the top of the screen. You'll find yourself at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com, where you can become a patron for as little as $5 per month and get access to our entire audio archive dating back to 2012, including past episodes of this program, all of our other shows, and hundreds of standalone releases, all of them ad-free and available to download or stream. If you happen to use Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, or YouTube, you can follow and subscribe to Chilling Tales for Dark Nights there, where you'll get all of our latest updates and new releases, and have the chance to interact with us each and every week. You'll find me personally on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram as well. Until next week, listener, when we meet up once again atop the Horror Hill for yet another dance with darkness. I bid you good night. Sleep tight, listener. And whatever you do, if you hear scratching at your door, don't open it. The darkness may have found you, but it's up to you to let it in. <laughs> Thanks for listening. You've been listening to the Horror Hill Podcast, a production of Chilling Entertainment and the creative team at Chilling Tales for Dark Nights, and a proud member of the Simply Scary Podcast Network. Visit simplyscarypodcast.com today to learn more about our network and our other amazing storytelling programs. Tonight's program was hosted and its featured stories performed by yours truly, Jason Hill. Selected stories have been adapted with the kind permission of their respective authors. Original music provided by Felipe Ojeda, Luke Hodgkinson, and Jesse Cornett. Final mixing and mastering by executive producer and director Craig Groshak. The program's artwork by yours truly, Jason Hill. Logo by Craig Groshak. Got a terrifying tale of your own that you like performed? I take submissions. Email it to us today at submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com to have your work considered for production in a future episode of this show. That's submissions at simplyscarypodcast.com. If you enjoyed what you heard on tonight's program and are joining us on your favorite podcast app, subscribe to us to be sure you never miss an episode and leave us a five-star review and a comment. Your feedback means a lot to me. You can also follow Chilling Tales for Dark Nights and yours truly on social media to connect anytime and get the latest updates on this and our other programs. If you're listening on the Chilling Tales for Dark Nights YouTube channel, do us a favor and hit the subscribe button and the bell notification icon for Chilling Tales for Dark Nights as well to get more spooky tales from me and the crew and another episode of this program each and every week. And don't forget to hit the thumbs up button to tell us how we're doing and leave a kind word. And don't forget to visit us at ChillingTalesForDarkNights.com and consider supporting the team by becoming a patron. In addition to helping us out, you'll get exclusive access to our audio archive and ad-free downloads of all your favorite stories, including those you've heard on this program. As for me, I'll be back next week with more terrifying tales to keep you up all night. If darkness is what you're after, listener, your search is over. Yet, let it be known, you haven't found the darkness. The darkness has found you.